because she had that baby and said, that is not my son's child. Listen. You wrong, you wrong, just how wrong. wrong about you wanted to, you you wanted to have a baby about him. Because you cheated you without protection. You You've been keeping track of... Different women that I've slept with. <laughs> Somebody come in and tell you 16 years later you got a child. Sexual so you have in your calendar the dates you were intimate with women. But you boyfriend. slept with my brother too. So if, if okay, twice the Ms. pain? Ms. Garen, please tell. How did you end up with his brother too? I was really young at the time and You keep the talking best... about how young you were. If you were so young, you shouldn't have been sleeping with everybody. In an unexpected twist that catches everyone off guard, the mother is here to prove the paternity of her nine-month-old son in an effort to save her relationship with the alleged father, Mr. James. She firmly believes that resolving the paternity issue will heal their relationship. Mr. James expresses his doubts about the paternity due to past infidelities, setting the stage for a complex case. As they stand there, you can't help but think that this is less Maury and more CSI Relationship Edition, where DNA tests meet daytime drama. Stay tuned, because the next revelation is something you won't want to miss. Miss Coward, you claim you're here today to determine the paternity of your nine-month-old son in an effort to save your relationship, his alleged father, Mr. James. Mr. James, you say Miss Coward has cheated on you in the past, and you argue you not only have good reason to doubt paternity, but say you can no longer trust her at all. Just when you thought relationships couldn't get more complicated, Mr. James recounts how their relationship started from casual observations within their apartment complex to giving her a ride and exchanging contacts. Despite initial disinterest from her, a chance encounter during a complex fight led to their first drink together, marking the beginning of their relationship. Their relationship evolved quickly from a casual to a committed one. It's like they went from I barely know you to let's make a baby faster than Mr. James can update his peculiar calendar. But just when you think you've seen it all, the plot thickens even more in the next clip. You've been keeping track of different women that I've slept with. I can't be too certain these days with somebody coming in to tell you 16 years later you got a child. I got a calendar to say that I didn't have it. Wow. Sexual so you have in your calendar the dates you were intimate with women. Yes, ma'am, I and do. And also a record of their monthly cycles. Yes, ma'am, I do. As the story unfolds in ways you wouldn't believe, the couple disputes the dates of intimacy, with Mr. James presenting a calendar that excludes certain dates that Miss Coward insists were when they were intimated. This discrepancy raises questions about the accuracy of Mr. James's records and his trustworthiness. The disagreement over these dates adds tension to the case, emphasizing the uncertainty surrounding the child's paternity. At this point, it seems like the only thing they can agree on is disagreeing, making you wonder if the real mystery here is not who's the father, but how they managed to stay together this long. What's coming next? is sure to add an even more dramatic twist to this already tangled tale. Also, when we slept together again after she came off her menstrual cycle. He didn't put all the dates on his calendar. I put all the dates on there. You didn't. You A N C her, initial. her initials. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so December 7th, December 13th, December 17th, January 16th. Can you believe what unfolded? The episode delves into the tumultuous nature of their relationship, highlighting instances of infidelity and trust issues, sort of like a soap opera, but with less amnesia and evil twins. Mr. James's skepticism about the child's paternity is rooted in their rocky start and Ms. Coward's past actions, making him wonder if Maury Povich needs to be on speed dial. This segment underscores the deep-seated issues between them, complicating the paternity question and adding enough drama to fuel a reality TV show marathon. Just when you think it can't get any more complicated, the next part adds another layer of intrigue. Seen him on his birthday. He picked me up from the grocery store. I have no recollection of that, but Just I'm like the one that keeps the calendar. He has no recollection of the You didn't put the grocery forget. store on your calendar? No, ma'am, I did not. I put my customers on the calendar. Mr. Well, the grocery store is not you that slipping, important. You gotta more, add so that in. What's not more important than <laughs> you know sexual? Hold on to your seats. Here it comes. As the birth of their child approaches, Mr. James's doubts persist, leading him to decide not to sign the birth certificate without a DNA test. Because apparently, he's not just dad material. He's dad material pending scientific confirmation. Despite his presence at the birth, his name ends up on the birth certificate. A fact that surprises him more than finding out the baby's first word is lawyer. This moment highlights the ongoing tension and mistrust even at significant life events, turning what should be a Hallmark movie scene into a suspense thriller. And trust me, the drama doesn't stop here. The next scene will leave you speechless. I wanted to see it all the way through, and when he came out looking a spitting image of his mother, he looked every bit like his mother, I had my doubts started raising. But as So family, as you look at Taj, do you see yourself? Do you think he looks like you? No, ma'am, I don't. You don't see any part of you in his features or anything? No, ma'am, he looks just like his mother from his nose to his eyes.
the climax of the episode comes with the revelation of the DNA test results. These results were prepared by DNA Diagnostics when it comes to Taj James. Mr. James, you are the father. Thank you. I told you. Come on, you want her? In the grand finale of The Trials and Tribulations of Mr. James and Ms. Coward, we find our protagonists standing in the eye of the storm, their courtroom drama reaching its peak. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more intense, the plot throws a curveball that would make a baseball player weep with envy. Meanwhile, in the jury box, a juror is caught smuggling in popcorn, turning the courtroom into his personal movie theater. And let's not forget the court stenographer who, amidst the chaos, starts writing her own fantasy novel, inspired by the dramatics unfolding before her. I just hope this makes our relationship relationship better. How do you feel about that? I'm happy. I'm ecstatic. I mean, like I said, I've been there for him from day one and I love him a lot. I hope you understand now that trust is a foundation. So one night, Mr. Irvin turns into a super sneaks, huh? Because he's got this funny feeling about Miss Fonzie. He waits till she's snoozing and grabs her phone, only to find out she's been playing him. When he's like, what's up with this? She's all, yeah, I cheated. So what? You did it first. Boom, drama, bomb. Meanwhile, outside, there's this truck selling cheater churros and betrayal bites or something, making a killing off people munching away while watching their soap opera unfold live. One day I was, um, I couldn't sleep. So here it is, four in the morning. So, um, I seen her sleeping and her phone was right beside her. Some told me to just go through her phone. So I found out she spent the night at her friend's house with this other guy. But I came to him and let him know that I cheated on him. After he she found out, she always going out with her friends. He could never he go, go out with his friends. Then hold your horses, because Miss Fonzie goes all drama queen on us, saying her fling wasn't just a one-time oopsie, but a whole series of oopsies with some dude. Mr. Irvin's world spins like he's on a bad amusement park ride, and it hits him. They're both masters in the art of being sneaky snakes. The judge is like, y'all need to learn trust is worth more than gold, while an innocent little one is stuck in the middle of their circus act. Just be honest, if there's something else you haven't said, were all of the times you had sex with this other gentleman protected? Did this sexual relationship extend on a little further than what it wasn't you no further saying. than November. It, it was all the time before Jordan called me cheat. When he called me cheat, I, I wasn't still talking to him. You knew to block him because you knew I was gonna Jordan, catch you, you in. You, you was him. right there when I blocked him. You, you wanted you want me, but you been telling so. something about me. Yes, it's it about is. You. you cheat on me, not cheating on you. You let me block. Listen, 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 listen. It doesn't matter, Miss Fonzie. We lose that game. We lose that. I, I don't understand when women are gonna ever get this. We need a Facebook post about this. Now, imagine we're flipping to the funniest part of a comedy show, where they're revealing who the kiddo's dad is, but it's all dramatic, like a game show finale. The biological father is Mr. Winfield. Mm. I knew it, I told you, I, I knew it wasn't his baby, but Jordan, we Jordan, all on. went to the hospital Ms. and that baby, she knew no, it wasn't. No, no, no. My mama went to the hospital when she had that baby and said, that is not my son's child. Listen. You wrong, you wrong, just how wrong. wrong. You wanted to, you you wanted to have a baby about him. You you lie. You lie. The episode opens with introductions and an overview of the case, setting the stage for a roller coaster of emotions, paternity puzzles, and the occasional comedic relief when the judge can't help but smirk at the absurdity of the situation. Mr. Deggs is on pins and needles, hoping to be confirmed as the biological father of Jason, the three-year-old son of his ex, Ms. Guerin. He claims Ms. Guerin initially told him he was the father, but then doubts crept in like unwanted party crashers when Jason was six months old, making him wonder if he should have asked for a paternity test or a crystal ball. You won't believe what happens next. Mr. Deggs, you are here today hoping you are the biological father of the defendant's three-year-old son, Jason. You have petitioned the court for paternity test because you claim your ex, Ms. Guerin, first led you to believe that you were Jace's dad, but when the baby was six months old, she confessed that you may not the biological father. You say Jason is the most important thing in your life, just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, Ms. Guerin admits to infidelity during their relationship, blaming her wanderlust on a lack of affection from Mr. Deggs. The tension escalates faster than a soap opera plot twist, as both parties reveal their unfaithfulness and the dramatic impact it had on their relationship, turning the courtroom into a stage for their personal telenovela. But hold on, the next part is even more jaw-dropping. He was never home. He was always... I work, Your Honor. I work full-time to okay, make sure that her nails... After, and and the... he left me in the apartment all the time with a roommate that he working. knew was Full attracted time. to me and wanted to be with me. And so you did what? Your home and the best friend's home? Well, we were drinking and he was showing interest in me, made me feel pretty and was giving me everything at the time that Jason was not. And that one day no. at work he gave you everything, Mr. 
Mr. Deggs never gave you? No, I did not say that. Yep. Ms. Garen, did you regret it or you just felt like, I'm yes. so glad he thinks I'm cute? No, absolutely, I regretted it. I, it was awkward to know that I was from but my But you boyfriend. slept with my brother, too. Yes. You After. slept with my best friend and my oh, brother. Please tell the Twice court. The How did you end up with his brother, too? His brother, I was really young at the time. and You keep the talking best... about how young you were. If you were so young, you shouldn't have been sleeping with everybody. As the plot thickens, we dive deeper into their troubled past. Both Mr. Deggs and Ms. Guerin share their desires for a family and the love they have for Jason, painting a picture of what could have been a perfect family portrait if it weren't for the infidelity, lack of trust, and communication breakdowns, making everyone wonder if they were aiming for a family or a reality TV show. The drama escalates in the next scene, so stay tuned. He was paying me the attention that Jason was not. Because I was if at work. I felt, I felt replaceable to what Jason. What did you want me to do? I felt replaceable. So yes, I did look for affection and everything I want in a relationship in I somebody moved, else. I moved you in. in you paid else. nothing. You were taken care of. You worked you for did. the you newspaper. You moved out of your mom's. Yeah. So you're like barely work for making the it in a but still, apartment. She's so a hoe. after he slept with <laughs> you two, okay, she might she not my know brother. how to respect each other outside of the courtroom. We must remain respectful. This next revelation will have you on the edge of your seat. The discussion shifts to the importance of Jason in their lives, with Mr. Deggs expressing his unwavering commitment to being a father figure, regardless of the DNA test's outcome, like a contestant in the most emotionally charged episode of Who's Your Daddy? Ms. Guerin, on the other hand, acknowledges her mistakes but emphasizes her belief in Mr. Deggs' potential as a father, suggesting a future co-parenting spin-off series. Brace yourself for the unexpected twists yet to come. After you found out Ms. Guerin slept with your best friend and your brother, Thanks. you were done with her. No. No, Your Honor. I loved her that much that I wanted to work on it again. And then I met somebody else was taking care of me, and I ended up sleeping with him while I was with Jason. When you give birth yes. to the child, he was there. Yes, was he was there. there. I cut forward. I've been there since day one taking care of this baby and this woman. In a turn of events that feels straight out of a primetime drama, the emotional stakes are higher than the ratings of the show, as Mr. Deggs describes how his world revolves around Jason, with a love so deep it could rival the most passionate of love songs. The possibility of non-paternity hits him like a plot twist in a season finale, showcasing the deep bond he has formed with the child amidst the backdrop of his roller coaster relationship with Ms. Guerin, proving that sometimes reality is stranger and more touching than fiction. And just when you think the emotional roller coaster has reached its peak, the courtroom drama takes another unexpected turn. Of course. I had a rough childhood. Of course. I wanted to be I just want to say that I did decide not to tell Jason right away because I did want the family. I did believe that Jason was going to be a great dad. And I, that I was am a great dad. I'm a great dad right now. Unfortunately, you got that bomb dropped on you. I think we were in an argument, and I know where she throws at me. Probably not even Jason, daddy of Jason anyway. No, I, I crumbled right there. started like crying. That. I would never what? do that. You told me after this long that I'm not the daddy and we're in an argument? What is it? Am I the dad or am I not? This next chapter might as well be lifted from a critically acclaimed family drama. As Mr. Felton espouses his fatherly virtues, Mr. Degg's inner turmoil escalates, his thoughts ping-ponging between concerns for Jason's well-being and the bewildering realization that he might actually miss Gerald's sarcastic commentary. The judge, meanwhile, continues to drop dad jokes with the finesse of a seasoned comedian, inadvertently sparking a debate among the court stenographers over which sitcom best represents their current predicament, Full House, or Arrested Development. Stay tuned, because the story line twists into even more unexpected realms next. You're saying that you are the man I mean, that stepped I, I do, up. I do things that a father is supposed to do. Right. I never try and take the place of his biological father. I'm not his biological father. And what is it that you do for the child? I take care of him. You know, when Megan's working, if I have the day off, then of course I'm taking care of him. If he needs to go to an appointment or something, make sure he gets there. It's fun to be around. Of course, he's a three-year-old. He tests your patience sometimes, but... What do you want from this, Ms. Guerin? Do you want Mr. Dag to be the father? For me right now, no. I don't, I do not not want Jason to be the father because every weekend it's drama. Another girl. What do you want from today? I want to be in Jason's there. life. I love Jason. No. That's why With he's all called my heart us and for soul. the last. And if he is your son, are you willing? Yes, of In course. every way. In every way. Imagine a courtroom drama unfolding like a scene from a zany cartoon. When it comes to baby Jason, Mr. Day, you are not the father. So that he could get whatever benefit he's getting out of it. Benefit? But honestly, what Your benefit Honor, am I wait, 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 wait. Taking no. care of a three-year-old child. I am disgusted. You would perpetrate this lie on this man during your entire pregnancy up through a delivery room, let him cut the 
cord on a baby. I know you know good and well that wasn't his child. I can tell by the look on your face today. He was more nervous than you were. The court session starts with Judge Judy's long-lost cousin, Judge Justice Judgey, banging the gavel and calling the case of Jones versus Houston to order. As both parties exchange glares that could freeze lava, we're primed for a saga that's less Romeo and Juliet and more Maury Povich meets the Kardashians, centered around paternity, young love gone awry, and who's gonna foot the bill for Baby Lyric's future rap career? You won't want to miss what happens after the commercial break. Today's case is unfortunately another one of these cases about young love and pregnancy. Ms. Jones, you and your mother say you are tired of the defendant's denial. He's the biological father of your six-month-old son, and once the DNA results prove your claim, you demand to be reimbursed for Baby Lyric's child care expenses. Ms. Jones takes the stage, painting a picture of a love story that took a nosedive into a dramatic teenage soap opera, complete with immaturity, nosy in-laws, and a not-so-secret love triangle. The highlight reel of their relationship's downfall features a messy timeline of breakups, makeups, and accusations of cheating, turning the courtroom into the set of a reality TV show where everyone's ready to throw a chair or two. And just when you think you've seen it all, the next revelation is about to drop Jaws even further. Because she used to let my daughter use her phone, like, to play on. My daughter's, like, um, she's 15 now, but she would let her use the phone at my house, sitting on my couch, because she used no, to come I off, never I let, came over no, to my I house never all the time. Her daughter and so she would be in the phone. My, my daughter would just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Well, all of a sudden, she came to me and she said, Mama, you wouldn't believe what came across uh, Miss Jones's phone. And I was like, what? She said, look. And a, a gentleman said, did you have a good time last no, night? No, God never takes Bottom me. line is, you're denying their allegation that some man was texting you, some other boy. Miss Jones shares that she waited until she was eight months pregnant to inform Mr. Houston and his family about the child fearing their reaction due to the tumultuous relationship. This moment highlights the complexities and emotional turmoil surrounding the pregnancy announcement. It's as if she was prepping for a surprise party where the surprise was a whole new human being and the RSVP was way overdue. I told him when I was eight months, because that's, I had to- Told him when you were eight months? Yes. Oh, my yeah. mom. Told no, my mom she called me on my yeah. phone. Because he didn't have a phone at the mom. time, Your Honor, because he didn't have a her. job. Your Honor, she's been dis like disconnecting herself this whole time. She's like, the I don't, what that's between you and Nigel. That's between you yep. and Nigel. So Ms. she Houston, doesn't have you you stepped out of the picture. You said it was between her and her, your son. Yes, ma'am, because it's so much drama going on. The court learns of Mr. Houston's new relationship with Ms. Hasty, who is also pregnant with his child. This revelation underscores the tangled web of relationships and responsibilities facing the young individuals involved. Mr. Houston, it seems, has been busier than a bee in spring, pollinating relationships left and right. Yeah, she didn't tell me until she found out she was pregnant. Y yes, Your Honor, that's how it happened. How the heck I'm up now? No, she's Facebook, pregnant. And how I know you was dating her. Pregnant, all of a sudden, the phone call came. With two girls pregnant at the same time. Same no. time. Well, if you would've known the first one, maybe he wouldn't have did the second one. Oh, well, if you wouldn't, if y'all wouldn't going through all that drama, if y'all wasn't so drama. No. Reaching out. That's they were the I'm ones who would One at a time. I can't hear you all. Out to Mr. Houston and his mother because she don't have enough to teach her son with respect yeah, anyway. They're very and disrespectful. And to take care of his own, They was okay? disrespectful the whole time. Even so why would she want to deal with him? Amidst the chaos, Ms. Jones's best friend comes forward with a diary that allegedly holds the truth about the paternity mystery. However, when opened in court, it's mostly filled with what seems to be a mix of dramatic teenage angst and cake recipes, further adding a layer of absurdity to the proceedings. The courtroom momentarily turns into a bizarre episode of MasterChef meets Judge Judy, leaving everyone slightly more confused but oddly craving dessert. When you were working, a co-worker told you something about Ms. Jones. Am my, I correct? My manager did. What did they say? He seen Nigel come in and he said, is, is this the dude that dated Nakisha? And I said, yeah, that's him. And he was like, the dude told me and that's over there stalking. And he pointed him out to me and was like, that told him that she, he was the father of her child. So when did yeah. I ever have time to cheat? Um, At school, we why why would the store manager just come out of the blue and say something like that? I don't know. The judge delivers a stern lecture on responsibility, education, and the need for Mr. Houston to find employment to support his children, peppering his speech with anecdotes that are equal parts enlightening and embarrassing. He mentions that even his cat has a job patrolling the house for unwelcome pests, which gets a few chuckles from the courtroom. This moment, while heavy on the life lessons, doesn't forget to sprinkle in humor, emphasizing the importance of guidance and accountability for young parents. The judge wraps up his monologue with a lighthearted warning that if Mr. Houston doesn't shape up, he might just enlist him 
him in the court's new parenting boot camp, led by the judge's famously strict grandmother. Close to $3,000, $2,000. $2,819, ma'am. Clothes, diapers, food, toiletries, toys, books, totaling $2,819 and, and furniture. You've not gotten one dime of support from Mr. Houston. No, ma'am. You admittedly haven't sent any money. Do you have a job? No, I go to school. <laughs> What about after school? How in the world do you think you making babies in this world and don't have a job? Who's supposed to take care of them, me? Mm -hmm. how, how do you think you cannot have a job? What? How do you, what? I couldn't it's hear called, you. No, it's called excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am? See, we're gonna get it right in here today. I don't know teaching you, but I'm gonna give you a lesson. I'm teaching. In the case of Houston versus Jones, the DNA dance-off has ended with a definitive beat drop. Mr. Houston, you are the father of Little Lyric. The judge, donning a robe and a DJ's headset, dropped the gavel and laid down the verdict. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Houston, you are the father. Boom! Yeah. Miss Jones, Miss Jones, don't, don't act silly. Don't act silly in here. Don't do it. I know you feel somewhat vindicated. I realize that. But this is not a time to perform because this is not a joke. You're 20 years old. Mr. Houston is 18 years old. You At 18 years old, you have a six-month-old and a six-week-old and no job. We must change this.